This is BBC One. And now tonight's documentary in which Nick Ross reports on the country's single biggest killer. Joy rides at Crystal Palace in South London in 1896. Stand clear! The dawn of the age of the motor car and Britain's first fatality. It's said that at the inquest, the coroner expressed the hope that this sort of thing would never happen again. But it did. By 1931, six and a half thousand people every year were being killed on Britain's roads. And despite the transformations of half a century since then, the figure stayed more or less the same for 50 years. It's a form of death we meekly took for granted. Each year we annihilated the equivalent of a market town like this one. After the age of four, until the age of 44, we're still more likely to die in traffic accidents than through any other cause. Doctors who cope with the carnage are angry and despairing. Well, I think it's, it's difficult to know how to change the psychology of a, of a society. And that's really what it amounts to, that people seem to uh, take tremendous notice of um, um, uh, research into cancer, research into all sorts of things, which are certainly important. But hardly anybody thinks about uh, road traffic accidents as an epidemic. And certainly it is the biggest epidemic of our times. Three years on, it's still the biggest epidemic. Yet we know it can be conquered. And now we have the proof. Three years ago, we showed a driver dying in a way that almost certainly couldn't happen now. It was a Friday night near Reading. Despite the frantic efforts of his rescuers, in a few moments from now, a motorist will be dead. When I arrived, his pulse was um, gone and his um, airway was blocked, actually. Uh, although he was alive, apparently, when the ambulance first arrived. The dead man shouldn't even have been hurt. His car had overturned, but was otherwise undamaged, and he'd escaped without a cut. But remember, this was before the wearing of seat belts in the front was made compulsory. He, he was uh, frothing at the mouth through half strangulation of his tie around his neck. I immediately released him and put an airway in his mouth. But uh, quite a job to put it in because the pressure of his head against the dashboard and the position he was in, his teeth were cramped against cramping against his tongue. Uh, so his job to force the airway in to, to enable him to breathe. He'd been thrown right out of his seat, had he? Yes, literally, out of the seat, upside down. The driver's name was Alex Blackall. He'd intended this journey to be a short one, from his mother's back home to his wife and child. Despite her grief, his widow consented to these scenes being shown, in the hope, she said, that they might do some good. They did. Alex Blackwell didn't die in vain, and the fat sacrifice of his family has made a very big contribution to public safety. Barry Sherman, one of the few MPs of any party who's campaigned and always said the killings can be stopped. We now have one vital piece of legislation, the best piece of public health legislation probably this century. We've seen 500 people in the first year saved from death, 7,000 from serious injuries. That is a remarkable achievement, but it's only the first step. If we could get through the complacency that exists, we could now start really cutting down deaths and serious injuries by 50%. This is the precise equivalent of colliding with a dashboard at just 25 miles an hour. For decades, dummies were dropped and catapulted into things, yet we refuse to be convinced. Belatedly, the seatbelt law has been an unassailable success. Accident specialist Dr. Sheila Christian. I suppose it's rather like the virtual elimination of cholera in London when someone realised that the cause of the cholera was partly due to the inadequate or indeed absent sanitation and when laws were passed to improve that situation.
seat belts have really been as dramatic as that. Oh yes, yes. On ten occasions, seat belt wearing legislation was proposed in Parliament. Nine times it was rejected. In the years it took MPs to procrastinate, to talk loftily about liberties, then to change their minds, thousands of their constituents died needlessly and tens of thousands more had their faces and their eyes embedded in broken glass. Cheers. Cheers. Say again and now needs to be applied right across the field. Here are typical examples that, just like Alex Plackle's death, could have been avoided. This car collided with another. Because of the new seatbelt law, the driver and her husband in the front escaped the consequences. Unfortunately, Parliament didn't care so much about their son who was sitting in the back. Without the protection of a belt, he was thrown forward by the impact he catapulted past his parents in the front and hit the windscreen. He died soon afterwards. Because we haven't got round yet to wearing belts in the back, this, or something like it, happens 60 times a day. At first sight, this is something that can't be solved. But it can be, and we'll show how. The driver of this van was travelling past a bus when a couple who just got off stepped out into the street. They were struck and both of them soon died. 2,000 people die like this every year. 60,000 more are injured. And while other countries have found ways to protect pedestrians, we, it seems, prefer to kill them. Then there's the legal culling of young motorcyclists, the next thing that cries out for reform. The owner of this machine was given more power than he could handle. He's dead. Mercifully, he didn't hit anyone else when he lost control. 20,000 like him die or are crippled every year. And cyclists are dying needlessly as well. Six and a half thousand dead or badly injured every year. The 11-year-old who owned this bike was struck by a car from behind and has serious head injuries. If we, society, only cared enough, it could have been avoided. The Department of Transport says effective new road safety measures will not be easy because most of those which are obvious or easy to bring into operation have already been taken. Rubbish. Let's not politely mince words about this. Most of what we call accidental deaths and injuries on the roads aren't really accidents at all. And maybe we should stop calling them accidents. They're the result of negligence by almost all of us, of willful irresponsibility by some, and of inertia and apathy by Parliament. Dozens of solutions are right at hand. We only need to reach for them. The rear seat belt law should be introduced, hopefully with a minimum of delay, and certainly not with the terrible prolonged agony of the 10 years at least taken by our successive governments to introduce the seat belt laws for the front. In fact, crazily, because we're belted in the front, we're more at risk now travelling in the back. You don't like belts? Why not? Uncomfortable. So you don't wear them? No. I'll see if this changes your mind. <laughs> the injury severity of the back seat passenger at the moment is exactly double that of the belted front seat passenger in terms of severity. How convinced are you that compulsory wearing of seat belts in the back of cars would be as effective as it is in the front? I'm completely convinced, based on evidence that is quite unchallengeable. Jesus! <laughs> seven miles an hour. Only seven. 
glad it's not 40. <laughs> well, I was paralysed from my neck down. 13 years ago, Dorothy Fisher was a backseat passenger when the car she was travelling in crashed. I've got a little boy who's six months old, and uh, I think about him a lot. I think, how am I going to cope with him when I get home? I, you know, I would love to be able to hold, hold him, and I think about him a lot, and I think about my future in general. Uh, how am I going to... Obviously, I'm not going to be able to be the same as I was before, and I just hope that I'll get better and better. She didn't. Well over a decade later... Well, well um, I'm completely dependent on other people, and really, I can't do anything for myself. So, sure. except shrug, shrug my shoulders. <laughs> Murray Mackay, one of the world's leading accident researchers. First of all, if you could get everybody in the back of cars wearing belts at the same rate that they now wear them in the front, we'd save something like 70% of the people in the back who now die. And in addition to that, we'd save a fair proportion of correctly belted front seat occupants who are now killed by unrestrained grannies hitting them from behind. And here in this metro, we've got a case where an unrestrained passenger from the back uh, hit the back of the driver and, and enhanced his injury because of that. The politicians have seen the front seat belt legislation work very successfully and now they've washed their hands of the whole traffic safety area. They tend to say, well, we've done our bit and that's enough. Patently, it isn't. If adults need protection in a car, how much more so children? They account for one in four of rear seat passengers, yet only a fifth are properly restrained. It's all so self-evident, yet quite illogically, parents who'd think twice about driving with, say, crockery perched precariously on the back, take no precautions with their most precious possessions of all. In a frontal crash, they'll turn into projectiles. 6,000 are killed or injured like this every year. Even in rear impacts, as this American test film shows, unrestrained children are at risk. Anyone thrown out of a car is at least four times more likely to die than those who stay inside. Whether in the front or back, at just 20 miles an hour, a baby's forehead will hit whatever is in front of it with the force of a quarter of a ton. Some parents believe their children will be safer if they hold them in their arms. In reality, their children cushion them. For just a few pounds, children can be made as safe as adults. To drive with children without taking these precautions is little more than recklessness. Parents maybe take great risks with children out of ignorance, but that excuse won't wash with Parliament, which should know better, nor with manufacturers who do know better. 90% of new cars still aren't even fitted with rear seat belts. In fact, most of the manufacturers are quite openly irresponsible and encourage us to be so too. They feed our hunger for danger and excitement. They've turned mere traffic into trafficking, pushing vehicles whose speeds far exceed the legal limits. Actually, each car in Britain is statistically far more likely to kill or injure than any gun. There have been big improvements in vehicle design. But in a highly competitive market, safety is rarely top priority. What few independent tests there are usually rely on the manufacturer's goodwill. Detailed test reports are therefore often confidential, which leaves the suspicion that companies frequently do no more than comply with the minimum requirements of the law, requirements they help set. The industry has always said that safety doesn't sell, 
but in fact a number of manufacturers have now made a virtue of it and are, are tremendously successful commercially just by selling safety. Volvo is the great exception. Most manufacturers are embarrassed at us thinking of their products bent and broken. None has shown the courage to compete effectively with Volvo over safety. Even those whose job it is to warn us seem to suffer from blinkered curiosity. Don't look here or in the papers for protection when the crunch comes. There are reams of published information about comfort and reliability, but little about the things that could well kill you. The only real change, which magazine was stung by our programme three years back and does now feature safety, along with rust-proofing and all the rest. In terms of the responsibility for introducing better crash performance, I believe primarily it rests with governments to do this. The knowledge is there in the industry and in the research community, but it's up to the governments really to translate that into effective legislation which reflects current knowledge. It doesn't do that at the moment. Lorries are a classic illustration of how indifferent designers and only piecemeal advances in the law have simply failed us. It's been recognised for years that high backs on lorries are death traps waiting for victims to run into them. After years of vacillation, simple guardrails will from now on stop pedestrians and cars from being swept beneath the wheels. Sixty die like this each year. Here, the gaps between the wheels have been filled by sensible design, and even frontal impact can be made much safer. It needs a hundred pounds worth of telescopic bumper on every lorry. It could save 250 lives a year. So we could make our streets safer by better vehicle design. And we will, but oh so slowly. In the meantime, those most at risk from this complacency are pedestrians. Most people grossly underestimate the danger that they face. Almost as many pedestrians are killed as car occupants. They account for one in three of all fatalities. When adults die, they're either elderly or a quarter of all of them are drunk. But easily most vulnerable are boys. It's Saturday in Slough and James Scroggy has been down to the shops to buy a present for his father. Now they're fighting to keep him breathing. Surprisingly, it's been known for years that in accidents at up to 30 miles an hour, injuries as bad as James's might be avoided simply by better vehicle design. From Birmingham University, Steve Ashton. We talk about pedestrians being knocked down. That's perhaps not the best analogy. The best way of describing it is to consider ourselves as skittles and the car is the ball. The front of the car hits the legs and knocks the legs away and we're picked up by the car, bending over onto it and striking it. If the head strikes at the edge of the bonnet, where it joins the scuttle or the wings, that can cause serious head injury because that's a very stiff structure. If you hit the wiper arm, that's stiff and small. It can punch a hole in the head. 
but we have seen a change in the way cars are designed in recent years, mainly due to aerodynamic considerations. Bumpers are becoming wider, that spreads the loads over a greater part of the leg and increases the speed at which you have to hit a person before the leg breaks. We're getting smoother structures, less likely to put in concentrated loading. This is a particularly good vehicle here, but it's a nice soft structure. We're seeing changes in this area in the way it's designed, but it's still got a lot of hazardous points to pedestrians. But there are vehicles on the road which have got soft front ends. This vehicle has got a full face soft structure. Hit a pedestrian with that and it spreads the loads over the legs. Now if we really cared about our pedestrians, we designed vehicles with soft front ends. By doing that, we could reduce the number of pedestrians seriously injured by about a third. So the James. James. And, and the, uh, the police took the I'll give you some more details. The rate at which we kill and hurt our children has declined in recent years, but largely because fewer children have been born. Other countries have done much more than we have in protecting youngsters, and their response has been much better than has ours. This is the only situation that I know of where an adult could harm a child, very seriously, even kill a child, but society puts responsibility on the child. In Nottingham, Professor Ian Howarth has been monitoring training and accidents to children, and his conclusions are surprising. They contradict the view that children are too naive to understand danger on the roads. They show that this sort of training works. His conclusions are emphatic, that instead of blaming children, we need to point the other way. Our studies show that drivers, in contrast to the children, hardly ever anticipate danger until it's too late. We never saw a driver slow down or swerve until the car was within stopping distance of the child. So that a driver who claims that the child ran heedlessly into the road and there was nothing I could do to prevent the accident is probably got himself into that position through his own failure to anticipate the danger. We believe that a concentrated program of traffic engineering, propaganda, backed up by legal sanctions, which would make it much more difficult for a driver to plead, there was nothing I could do to prevent the accident, we would in some way put responsibility back on the drivers when these accidents occur. The lesson is not that children must be kept away from roads, Frequently, that's neither practicable nor enforceable. Instead, the roads must take account of them. A researcher who's compared our approach with that abroad is Stephen Plowden. Most pedestrian accidents occur either on the streets where the pedestrians live or in the immediate neighbourhood. And the key to the problem is, first of all, to separate pedestrians from motor traffic. And secondly, where you can't do that, to slow the traffic right down. I mean to walking pace. And that can be done by widening the pavements, uh, putting in pinch points, planting, changing the surface, everything, so that the environment says to the driver, this is pedestrian territory, you're here on sufferance, behave, slow down. This is what the Dutch have done. It's surprisingly popular and expressed in deaths per head of population. Their pedestrians of any age are now twice as safe as we are. And in Sweden, in just 15 years, side road schemes like these helped cut child casualties by two-thirds. Cyclists can be protected by just the same techniques. As bus and train fares have gone up, in the last 10 years, cycling has become the fastest growing British mode of transport. Yet cycle lanes like these are very rare. Cyclists tend to be pushed aside by planners and by motorists alike. As a result, nearly 20 riders are killed or injured every day. And it's not because these schemes are too expensive. 
irresponsibly. Half of Britain's county councils don't even list cycling as a policy consideration. The costs are trivial. That's something that wouldn't cost anything at all. And in relation to what we spend on roads each year, thousands of millions, it's, it's a trivial element of cost. And the savings would be enormous. With cyclists, as with pedestrians, it's the young that suffer most. It's 2 a.m. in the intensive therapy unit, eight hours since James Scroggie's accident. He's in a deep and restless coma. His condition's still very critical, and we will keep close observation on him for the next 24 to 48 hours. There may be a possibility of um, some slight brain damage. He may not be quite normal, but um, there is a fair chance he'll be all right. children finish up like this each year or dead in fact James has survived ironically those youngsters who do survive coping as pedestrians or as cyclists do so only to become more vulnerable as they have to learn new road skills and worst of all is when they turn to motorbikes motorcycles are the greatest killer and maimer of the young in peacetime Britain he always had to be in for 10 o'clock, John did, when he was out on his motorbike. The Lewises from Sutton Coalfield. Of course, 11 o'clock, and I'm getting worried. And then the policeman came to the door. John had had an accident. His bottom jaw was broken on both sides, and his eyes were just like two big jack of oranges sticking right out of his face. The elbow had disintegrated on his right arm. That's why that arm is always in that position. There's a plate holding that two together. There's 27 screws in that plate. But the main injuries were head and face. precious little concern about the numbers that they helped to kill. They've been abetted by successive governments. A 17-year-old who knows nothing about bikes can still walk in, buy one up to 125 cc's and ride off on it. Of course, he'll have to wear a helmet. It's one of several measures introduced belatedly and by instalments that have helped disguise the fact that Whitehall doesn't have a systematic policy. 80 miles an hour and it's the first bike he's had his hands on. One day, motorbikes may be banned completely. Certainly, there are reasons to bar riders until they're 21, though the industry will lobby powerfully against it. Mile for mile, teenage motorcyclists are 10 times more likely to be involved in a fatal accident than a middle-aged riders. And it's not just their own families they leave broken-hearted. In a third of all fatal accidents involving a teenage motorcyclist, the victim is someone other than the rider. 30% of deaths and serious injuries on the roads arise from an accident in which a motorbike is involved. That's a hideous total. They only account for 3% of the vehicle mileage and 30% of the deaths and serious injuries. And it's no help blaming other motorists. Bikes are hard to see and too few cyclists make themselves conspicuous with headlights and with fluorescent clothing. Half of them are ill-equipped and virtually untrained. 
bike enthusiast and road safety officer, Peter Nelms. Motorcycling ought to be looked at in the same way as other forms of training for dangerous sports. That is, you wouldn't go aqualung diving without first of all going through a training session, being certified, getting the right equipment. You just wouldn't go out and jump off a harbour wall with an air lung and hope to survive at 200 foot depth. Yet many riders can't even stay upright on their machines. The response has been haphazard and often left to individuals, like dealer Graham Chatham. Well, I've always been aware of the accident situation with bikes, but it was brought home to me in a very dramatic fashion in one absolutely appalling week in which uh, six young lads were killed on bikes that I had personally sold them, and I found this totally unacceptable. So instead, with the cooperation of the local police, I've decided that company policy would be no training, no bike. If a novice wanted to buy a, uh, a bike from my company, he would have to undergo a basic four-hour training course. Four hours is precious little, but it's four hours more than is required by law. And when you see how many riders lack basic skill, it seems criminal that, according to the law, they're entitled on the roads. It's better than nothing at all, of course, but the success of basic training schemes like this is frequently disputed, except that is in one respect. What effect does this have on your sales? It's increased them. And that's the vicious circle. Even when you try your best, you're actively encouraging teenagers to take to bikes. If Whitehall has no stomach for radical reform, the least they might do is show some common sense. Researcher Stephen Plowden. It should not be possible for someone who's learnt on a learning machine then to go straight off onto the most powerful machine on the road. It should be compulsory to start at the lowest end, start with the moped. When you've had, let's say, two years on a moped with a clean record, you then become eligible to progress to a motorbike, and then you work your way gradually up the grade. Someone has to look after motorcyclists. If the government won't do it, they merely pass the buck to ambulance crews, doctors, and undertakers. Hold it yourself. Just put it over your face. Nice, slow, deep, deep breaths. Breath. Right. You have to really breathe. Nice, slow, deep breath, Chief. Your feet. Nice, slow, deep breath. <laughs> Tragically, it's not just motorcyclists that often learn the hard way. Novice drivers have been shown to be four times more dangerous than older ones with more experience. But Whitehall doesn't seem to understand its own statistics. In a report to Parliament this year, it said that candidates like this have learned enough when they're let loose on the public. All right, that's the end of your test, Mr. Dean. I'm pleased to tell you have passed. Former head of the British School of Motoring, Jeremy Barrett. How good is the L test? Useless. As a basic certificate of competence to handle a motor car, the driving test, which was developed in 1935, is excellent. But it is only a basic certificate of competence to drive. Unfortunately, the great British public assumes that the driving test is the final accolade. When somebody passes the driving test, they generally speaking have not driven at more than 30 miles an hour. They haven't driven in bad conditions usually because if it's heavy rain or if it's snow or whatever it may be, the instructor or the examiner will cancel the test or the lesson. So there they are suddenly with a piece of paper that says they can do anything. And they will. They have no idea. I'd like to see follow-up tests similar to that run by the Institute of Advanced Motorists, but compulsory. Drivers with an advanced test have been shown to have 25% fewer accidents. But that doesn't just mean flashy handling skills like this. It means defensive driving, always looking out for danger. The man who trains police in London, Frederick Wilson. Well, there's a myth about driving that the only thing that really matters is skill in controlling a person's own car. But the main thing is what other people are doing, not just what you're doing with your own car, perception. This is one of the very big things. You look for telltale signs, 
buses at bus stops, people are going to walk out from behind the bus. If someone is sitting in a car and there's a line of stationary cars, they're either going to get out and swing the door open or they're going to drive off. Smoke coming from the exhaust of a stationary car, it means he's likely to move off. The more experienced driver, of course, will learn these things over a number of years. That's why the more experienced, the older driver has less accidents. A typical accident that began with just a motorbike. The bike just went, and the bike just slew over. I turned round and I saw this vehicle here come screaming down the, the lane and just plow I think, the back of the transit. The resulting pile-up left a trail of debris down the motorway and at least one bewildered driver. All of a sudden, the whole thing just stopped, and I careered over here, and I took the back of this um, Volkswagen off. You were travelling too close, were you? No, not too close. No, no, no. They came to a stop, and I simply careered over to avoid. But why did you have to take avoiding action into another lane if you weren't too close? No, I was trying to get over here, because they all stopped together, you know, in a line. Practically. But you didn't have time to brake in your own lane? No, no, I had to career over. To, oh, I'd have been killed if I would have gone on. I'd have been killed, definitely. Almost all of us drive far too closely to other vehicles. On average, at just 40 miles an hour, it takes 120 feet of open road to stop a car. And though they sometimes put their nose right behind your tail, lorries take even longer. This is no exception, yet it's particularly safe. For Conoco, the owners have put the driver, Brian Saunders, through special training. There are an awful lot of clowns about on the road and certainly with this type of vehicle you've got to be prepared for them. You've got to read the road, be observant and see a situation before it actually develops. One of the problems, particularly with motorway driving, is uh, the clown in the middle lane. When he bought the car, he thinks that uh, he bought the middle lane because that's where he'll sit and this will cause bunching of traffic. People are riding on each other's bumpers and are uh, travelling far too closely. All Conoco's drivers take an advanced test at the company's expense. And it doesn't just stop there. They're given financial incentives to do regular refresher tests and to qualify for national competitions and awards. They end up not just safer, but richer and with badges of success. Salesman Martin Gill. I think that any other drivers in a similar sort of position would most certainly benefit from taking the driving tests. It's a little bit like the seatbelt law. I didn't wear my seatbelt as obvious as it may seem. One didn't until you were forced to do it by legislation, and then you realise the benefits of doing so. Here then is evidence advanced tests don't just work for a small band of enthusiasts, they work for anyone. And next time the government tells Parliament more tests are too expensive, they should talk to Director Brian Bodicum. He's done this to save money, and after 10 years he's... Very pleased indeed, because it's reduced the number of accidents by almost 50%. That in turn has reduced our operating costs, such as insurance premiums, damage repair costs. The insurance premiums, for take one example, they've reduced by 47%. When you consider the fact that there are over 80% of the vehicles that are on the road are commercial vehicles, heavy goods, vans, cars, if they enjoy the experience that we're having at the moment, well, that would mean that in three years, all the road accidents would be reduced by 25%. If accidents are to be reduced, better training and refresher tests are bound to come. It could make us better drivers and maybe save us money as well as pain. But accident investigators have found another way to save us from ourselves. Jeff Stoughton from the Transport and Road Research Laboratory is one of the few people paid to analyse car accidents in anything approaching the same detail that's applied to rail or air crashes. And work like this has thrown up new and relatively easy ways to keep more of us alive. Well, I think the main thing that has come from this is that it is much easier to change the environmental conditions than it is to change the driver's education. We can, we can do small, low-cost remedial measures or small-cost changes which might make for the driver to comprehend what's going on rather than try and improve his driving standards in general. Bucknell's 
Lane Junction near Watford, an accident black spot. Dick Rainbird heads a team which has been pioneering low-cost highway improvement schemes here in Hertfordshire. The problem is with traffic backing from a traffic lights a quarter of a mile away and obstructing the junction in front of us. And drivers wishing to avoid this queuing traffic turn into this left turn lane. But instead of turning left, then drive straight through. We've had about seven injury accidents here through this in the past 12 months. So what are you going to do about it? Well, this is where by engineering changes, we shall make it impossible for a driver to drive straight through as we have done. Bring the bollards out and construct a, an extension to the small island in the side. And together with carriageway markings, make it absolutely clear that drivers should not be making the manoeuvre that we've just performed. So far from the complacent view that nothing can be done, substantial improvements are often simple and cheap. The problem here is a visual one for right turners turning into Belmont Hill, and they're just not judging accurately the gaps between oncoming traffic because of the slope of the hill. We've had a spate of right turning accidents here associated with this, half of which have involved serious injury. And what's the cost going to be of rectifying this one? Something just in excess of £600, which will give us a very high rate of return. What we're going to do is to change the appearance of this section of the road where the junction is by clearing parking opposite to the junction, painting some markings in the centre of the road to guide right turners and to give them a better position in the road to make their decision to make the right turn. Few highway authorities have taken advantage of these schemes, yet they save lives and money. Murray Mackay. The gap between what we know to be good environmental design and what we actually accept is absolutely enormous. It's the area, I believe, where most can be done quickly. If we applied what we know in terms of current knowledge, we'd save something like 20-25% uh, of current deaths and injuries just by applying what we know to be good design. American studies demonstrate how something as cheaply remedied as poor signposts can cause a major hazard. Some of the most promising accident prevention schemes are often effective despite the fact they seem perverse. Mini roundabouts make drivers feel uncertain and so they drive more safely. These simple blobs of paint have reduced accidents drastically in places. The same is true of no right turns. They may be an apparent inconvenience, but they're highly effective road safety devices. Right turns are the most common cause of collision in Britain. So the roads themselves could give us better guidance. And as we've seen, both vehicles and training can be improved. But there's still a fundamental danger, ourselves. Humans, and especially men, seem to relish an element of risk. traffic is viewed like this, it becomes apparent how astonishing it is that accidents are as infrequent as they are. Each movement by each road user involves risk. Just how much we feel at risk affects the way we drive. So we take extra care when we're nervous, but cease to pay attention or drive with more abandon when we feel secure. In the end, we need to be controlled. Speeding is a prime example. Speed is fun, and Whitehall gets bad advice. Many who lobby, supposedly on behalf of motorists, even some road safety experts, are really boy racers at heart. The government is being pressed to raise the limits. It would be villainous. The evidence is overwhelming. More speed, more dead.
In almost every instance in the world where speed limits have come down, so have the rates of injury and death. Left to our own devices, we behave badly on the roads. And the starkest demonstration is that we drink and drive. The statistics themselves are staggering. Alcohol is the greatest single factor leading to death and injury on the roads. At night, two out of every three corpses taken out of vehicles contain more than the legal limit of blood alcohol. A pathologist told us that after the nightly mayhem, some mortuaries smell like breweries. Most of us now drink and drive as much as we did before the breath test. The chances of actually being caught seem too remote. Seven out of ten men admit they drive after drinking two or more pints of beer. For most people, that's over the legal limit. After extensively researching drivers' attitudes, Dr. Andrew Clayton concludes that vague threats and propaganda will never be enough. Because it's such an ingrained social habit, most people go out to drink, and the easiest way of getting there is by car. People still don't appreciate the effects of alcohol on driving. I mean, we don't help. We talk about drunken driving. But you don't have to be drunk, as is commonly understood, for it to have an effect on your driving. Alcohol makes you more confident, more carefree. That's why a lot of people drink.
average cost of each fatal accident is over £100,000. And that, of course, ignores the human price. Tucked away behind the public problem, the personal catastrophe. I was unconscious for f about four months. I got run down by a car in 1968. I was four years old. Stephen is in a wheelchair from having a bang on the head. That's all, there's nothing else wrong with him. It's the sort of thing which I thought never could happen to me, but I'm, I'm pleased to say I've got the seatbelt on. If it happened to run straight through the screen. She was completely unconscious for five weeks. She didn't open her, her eyes for five weeks. My accident, can't remember. Blackout, death traps. I was in the back seat. Wasn't a belt in the back, you see. I was normal then. Not now. I can't run. Can't speak properly. I was out of work for two and a half years and um, I had to really sit back and start all over again. Literally, I lost my career through it. We can forgive, but we can never forget. It has changed my life completely. Ironically, by international comparison, Britain's record is a good one. Statistically, our victims should have been among the safest in the world. But our roads are still our most immediate threat to life and limb. Even in Northern Ireland, where twice as many people have died in traffic accidents as in the Troubles. Yet who do you know who's scared of going there in case they're in a road crash? If the world's worst air crash was repeated every month, they'd close the airports down. The Moorgate tube disaster could happen three times every week. Flixborough could blow up 200 times a year. And we could go and fight the Falklands War each fortnight, and they'd each still cause fewer casualties than do our roads. As a doctor put it, it's not just the biggest epidemic of our times but it won't be cured until the patient recognises that he's sick. Breakfast time tomorrow morning, Transport Minister Linda Chalker discusses tonight's programme and the government's record on road safety. There's an extra programme on BBC One at 10...